And we're going to start with the former uh, director of engineering at uh, Facebook, uh, who knows a thing or two about how to scale uh, infrastructure at a fairly high level. Um, so, Bobby Johnson. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot. I'm really happy to be here. Um, I guess before I get started, I, I would say a little bit more about my background. Is there a... So I was director of engineering at Facebook from 2006 to 2012, uh, where I was responsible for scaling from a few million users to almost a billion. Uh, this involved both sort of the live site stuff, like the memcache MySQL cluster, had a trillion objects, uh, several billion requests per second, uh, as well as a lot of the offline stuff. Uh, There's my team that brought Hadoop to Facebook, uh, Road Hive, and a lot of these things around doing analytics. Uh, I currently have an early stage startup that we're not really talking about publicly, so I won't say anything else about that. Uh, so today, so, so I worked on a lot of things at Facebook, and should people always you know, you know, give like, talks about kind of lessons learned. And one of the things I think was particularly interesting is a, a program called Scribe. It wasn't sort of the biggest or necessarily the most important part of the infrastructure, but it sat right in the middle of a lot of stuff. So it was kind of a piece of software that had a lot of opinions. Um, and... Uh, and so what it is is the logging system. So this is the thing that collects all the data uh, from, uh, from all the machines. So you have thousands of machines. Uh, those are running software. There are uh, you know, potentially uh, you know, lots of different use cases, measuring lots of things, logging all kinds of events. You want to get this in one place so you can actually do something sensible with it, uh, and you can start finding answers from it. Um, and so... Uh, So one of the so, so Scrub was actually not the first logging uh, logging system or I think logging systems are are just interesting because a lot of design patterns come up again and again that you bump into in a lot of other parts of life as well. Um, so about 15 years ago, I wrote a logging system for another startup. This was, you know, back then these open source tools didn't really exist. You part of building a distributed system is you got to write like a thing to get your logs in one place so you can look at them. Uh, and these kind of came in two flavors. Uh, these flavors both existed at Facebook before I wrote Scribe as well. Uh, one is the log collector. So the idea of the log collector is you just have, you, you write your logs on your machine and then you just have like a cron that like copies them into like a machine where you can deal with them. Uh, this is like the easy way to get logs. Um, and it sounds nice because it's really easy to do, but it has the obvious problem that it takes, uh, it's got a lot of latency. That however often you pull your files, that's as often as you see what's going on. Uh, it has a more subtle problem, which is actually much more important, which is a very bursty load. So when you're looking at... Uh, what I mean by bursty is that when you do this, you have you know, 30 minutes worth of data, and then at the end of 30 minutes, you do your copy, and you spend two minutes actually transferring all that data. So for that two minutes, you're doing 15 times the traffic that you could be if you were doing this spread out. And when you're scaling distributed systems, the enemy is bursts are like the enemy of everything. Because the, the actual thing you care about, and a lot of people sort of think that, oh, if I do less stuff, that's good, and my thing is more efficient. The only efficiency that actually matters is the peak throughput. So you want to know, <coughs> when I'm at the peak, I have enough capacity to be able to accomplish the task. And when you add this, this bursty load, that makes your peak a lot worse. What actually happens usually in practice is people don't actually allocate space for this, and then when the burst comes, their stuff just gets worse, and it doesn't really work for two minutes, and they wonder why they have sporadic problems. Um, these things also tend to be buggy. It's actually harder than, there's a lot of, there's a lot of crazy corner cases. You, know, you want to make sure you get every file moved over exactly once. You want to get... Uh, you know, if you get one halfway there and it fails, you've got to recover from that. So, so a lot of these systems I found really didn't work nearly as well as, as people thought, even though it was supposed to be the easy way, ironically. So the next step is you go to streaming system. The streaming system has the immediate downside that uh, it's very easy to lose data. You have, you know, if I've got systems that are supposed to be in real time sending data across, uh, errors are very conspicuous. Uh, but, but what we actually found is that when, when you switch to a streaming system, you actually have to handle exactly the same cases you do in the batch system. It's just much more conspicuous when you get them wrong. So we found is that over time, these systems actually were uh, significantly more reliable because you were, if, if you got it wrong, you knew immediately. Um, but they did have like, the, the very real con that uh, when they go wrong, they can go wrong much more spectacularly. If you have sort of your batch system, if you're, you know, the way it usually fails is your cron dies and then the files build up until you realize it and then you copy them off and you're, you're good again. Uh, whereas these will go haywire and kill networks and kill everything around them. 
Uh, the other thing you get with streaming is you get features. There's all kinds of awesome stuff you can do now. I've got my streaming server. I can, you know, I can do roll-ups. I can transform the data just right in line there. I can make this crazy graph of all these places and all these things I do to it. Um, and actually, the first logging system I wrote, the thing that everybody was excited about is we're going to have dynamic levels so you can turn on and off different logging things. Um, you know, 15 years ago, this is what people thought, like, that's what a logging system does. And so, uh, so we built a system that's awesome. You could have, you know, you could see it's a big dashboard. You could see all the like machines and exactly what all these categories and levels and exactly what was coming from what machine. Uh, nobody ever used it. And the reason nobody ever used it is is really simple. By the by the time you go to like turn up the logging on something to see what happened, it already happened. Like it's gone. And. Uh, you know, every once in a while there'd be something where this would come in useful, and there's sort of the caveat that sometimes when you're debugging or if you're, uh, you know, sometimes you want, but but something in production, and again, it's this peak capacity problem that if you have actual capacity in your system, where I can go turn on logging, like the log just you know just turn it on, like you have that capacity, and and again the, the converse is what usually happens to people when they try to do this stuff is that they they don't actually leave the capacity when they turn it on. There's not actually capacity for it. Doesn't work. And usually, the time when you're like turning up all your log levels is when you're in trouble, which is when you're already at high load, and so it just is a disaster. Um, so another thing when we so 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 when we set up on making scribe, we were very specific that it is just a transport. The, the transport and the data handling are really separate. Um, the other thing we uh, there's also a lot of discussion before we before we wrote scribe about whether it was even a good idea to do it. So at the time, there were three or four uh, sort of logging systems that we were using for various things. And they were all uh, various different flavors of things. And they were all kind of somewhat broken. And it was scaling really fast. Uh, it would have actually been a lot easier just to go fix them all. You know, it would have been a couple of weeks of work. But instead, we sort of embarked on we're going to build something general. And it was actually like it, it, was, it was a legitimate decision. And the kind of decision that often is correct to go the other way, that you, uh, you, know, you just fix what's broken and you move on with life. But, uh, we said, you know, we've got these four things, and we can think of maybe a couple other use cases. And we thought, you know, probably worth it if we had, you know, like maybe ten use cases. And if there's, you know, if there's four that we know about, there's probably ten that'll be there once we have a thing we can use. Uh, within a, uh, a few months of launching this, we had over a hundred categories being logged in this. People just came out of the woodwork. There are all kinds of things that we never expect, you know, things we had never th dreamed of that people found. Uh, one of my favorites was. Uh, we had a, uh, there, there's always sporadic uh, complaints about login. You know, somebody get logged out on the site. And nobody could ever reproduce it. Nobody actually believed that, like, this was really broken. Because it's like, login, this is, like, core to our, you know, this is, of course this is right. Uh, and then one day there was, a, there was an engineer who, uh, who, who got logged out. And he's like, I know that was, like, not OK. That was a bug. And so he wrote this ridiculously verbose log of everything that ever had to do with login. It's a huge amount of context. And he sat there for like two weeks, like pouring over these logs, and he found no less than 12 bugs in the login system. Um, so, so the other thing that happened is once we start, when everybody starts logging this, some people freaked out. They're like, oh my God, look, you know, look at all this data. This is, this is you know, like, how can you do this? There's all this data. And, and I was like, this is awesome. There's all this data. <laughs> uh, but it was, uh, there was sort of a constant battle that people were just afraid that we, uh, you know, sort of this slippery slope fear that like once you let make it really easy for people to log stuff, they're just gonna, they're gonna log stuff. And they're like, yeah. <laughs> and uh, what we found over time is that, uh, I mean, first of all, the amount of data that we had went up by maybe a hundredfold for logging data, but it was still small compared to everything else we did to run the site. So it didn't actually matter. And it, it mattered a little bit in the day to day that if you know, you run out of like the machines or the disks you have, then you you know something's got to drop. Uh, but what we realized is there's, there's a lot of performance things that are sort of death by a thousand cuts. But this was not like that at all. It was completely dominated by the five or ten categories of data that were the largest, uh, completely dominated. And we found an interesting thing is that you couldn't. It was you can just go ask people like how much. You know, you, you'd ask somebody like, oh, how much data do you think this is going to be, and I'm going to try to plan for that. Or you say, do you think that's a lot? Like, nobody knows. You're just like, oh, you know, you're logging 1.21 gigabytes or something. And it's just like, they don't know what the numbers mean. They don't know what it costs. They don't know what the value is. But what you can do is just say, like, these are like our top five things. Do these matter? And about half of them, you go to the person and you'd be like, hey, you know, you're one of the top five categories. Do you actually need to use a lot of disk space for this? And 
sometimes they'd be like, eh, no, not really. We can just sample it or throw it away after a while. And some of those things were enormously valuable. Um, and we found that a lot of other people would be very miserly with their data, and they would be very careful about not logging too much. And so, you know, and they think, oh my god, that's how many terabytes or whatever. And so, so we actually found that we were much better off. We went around encouraging everybody to log everything really verbosely. And in the occasional situation where somebody is, you know, putting in a massive amount, then we make a decision whether it's worth it. Um, how am I doing on time? I can take questions as well. Uh, I have one more thing. Uh, so uh, this might be a little more con controversial. Another thing that was, that was an important part of this was actually thinking really carefully about what, what kinds of data loss were OK and which weren't. Uh, now, so, so the logging data is very different than so, so things like site data, like user accounts. Like, there's a completely different slide for that. Uh, but for log data, essentially, if you you know, data you don't log is data that you lost also. So you really want to gear a logging system towards taking very, very large amounts of data. And what we found is that, uh, yeah, infrequent big losses are much better than frequent small losses. Basically, if you have frequent small losses, you never really know if a number is right or not. And the thing, the, so the environment you want to actually like maintain is that like either you're right or you know you're not right. And so, that's a case where, essentially, in a catastrophic failure, if you've got a graph that's going along and it's, just, and it's zero for a while and then it pops back up, that's like not great. I don't know what those numbers were, but I don't, you know, I'm not going to, you know, it's, it's very clear to me what happened there. I just have no data. Uh, whereas if you just sort of randomly pick one out of 100 messages and make those disappear, that's really, really bad. Um, and so, uh, so it's normally important to test this. Uh, the other thing we did is that. Uh, even after, when we first replaced existing systems with Scribe, we found that uh, most of the systems were anywhere from 2 to 10% rate of error on, uh, on the data they were logging. Uh, we also had some errors in Scribe, and Basic, but there were different errors, and we worked it out. And so we ended up keeping a couple old systems running simply as a matter of testing like black box correctness of one versus the other. And it was really easy for bugs to creep into these things. You, know, you have machines that you don't know about. You have uh, things get double sent. Uh, yeah, so uh, you know, some questions. I guess in terms of sort of like larger question, things to, to draw from this as well, like one of, the, one of the things I hear coming up a lot these days that we had, uh, it was a decision we made in the early days and I think paid off really well, is that the transport and the processing of the data really need to be different things. That you know, just because you can deal with stuff as it comes by when you're streaming like, doesn't mean that you should. Basically, the transport of your data to save it is enormously important to get it as directly and reliably possible on disk. And then you can do fancy stuff on the side if you want, but it's really important to keep that processing separate. Um, yeah, and the second thing is that you, uh, you know, so, so, sort of thinking you can just throw everything in memory is like not a good idea because you, this, whenever you can take more data, you can. And like people are happy. Like every marginal thing we ever added, somebody got some good out of. Um, I can take questions now for a few minutes. Yeah, we have time for one. Oh, hold on, hold on. Uh, let me give you the mic so it gets recorded. Uh, can you start with just your name and comment? Sure. Hello. Hi. My name is Ani. I'm from Bloomberg itself. So uh, the question I wanted to ask you is Scribe is mostly a, what I read, a network topology-based uh, data storage model. But most of the log applications, the benefit comes out of when users are easily able to roll up. So how do you an analyze the data sets? How do you roll up a search across? Yeah. Log well, I guess, I guess my argument is that the, the thing that the logging system should not be doing is rolling up, that those are very distinct things, that basically awful lot of the good you get from these logs is when you can pick through it an item at a time. And so uh, essentially there are strategies of, of logging where you try to do intelligent roll-ups at each spot so that you have something rolled up at the end. And uh, my experience is it's much better just to try to make that pipe really fat and just send everything and sort it out as a completely separate step. That's an after the fact, and you know, there's lots of ways to do that. So, uh, uh, if there is an error or an issue, how does a developer or somebody who's fixing bugs know where exactly to go to? Um, yeah, so the, uh, I mean, it, it depends at, at, at what layer of the stack. I mean, the, the, the hope is that you have enough testing around the pipeline that you know that the pipeline was good or not, so you can, uh, 
basically the, the pipeline should be able to tell you if it's had a problem, uh, which is hard to do self-consistently, which is why we would always run something side by side so we would catch if, if we started getting uh, disparate answers. And then if you can mostly guarantee that, then usually if you're missing something, it means that you didn't log it or you, uh, or you're somehow you're missing it on the query side. Cool. So you're going to be around now after eight, right? Are you going to stay yeah, around yeah, for a little bit? Yeah, okay. we'll awesome. So if anybody has uh, any more questions uh, and want to get Bobby drunk, <laughs> um, so you can do that after eight. 